voice whispers, Look at what you've done. We are marked by a lifetime of selfish choices, a legacy of harsh words and terrible thoughts. Look at what you've done. The constant jealousy, the envy of what others possess, the disregard for people and the pursuit for what we desire, what we insist we are entitled to, the enemy whispers, Look at what you've done. Medicating our emptiness with screens and swipes, entertaining ourselves with the wicked, the indecent, the disturbing, feeding on luxury while forgetting the poor, Satan whispers, look at what you've done. <clears throat> the betrayal of our own beliefs from height to hypocrisy Building the walls of our own kingdom, loving darkness more than light. Look at what you've done. The bitterness, the gossip, the brooding, the prejudice, the enemy is gloating. Look at what you've done. Look at all your shame. Look at all your guilt. Look at all your chains. Look at what you've done. You deserve wrath. You deserve hell. You deserve death. Look at what you've done. And really, he's right. That is what we've done. But to every whisper, to every accusation, we remind the enemy of Jesus. And we say, look at what he's done. He commanded the universe into being. Light emerged from his voice. That's what he's done. He scripted the totality of time and he wrote his glory into every line. That's what he's done. He stepped down from heaven, took on our flesh. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death. That's what he's done. Forgiving our sins. That's what he's done. Dying in our place. That's what he's done. He was dead, buried, but then he rose from the grave. That's what he's done. Death defeated, hell scorned, debt paid, veil torn. No matter our past, Jesus has overcome. The dead are alive. That's what he's done. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. Is this is a day of celebration because that's what he has done. Amen? Amen. So before we get going today, stand up if you can. It's okay if you sit down. Stand up if you can and, and give God a hand. Truth 
of Jesus' resurrection. Just as the dawn breaks after the darkest night, so too has our Savior conquered death and returned to us in glory. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving for this miraculous event. And may our worship today be a testament to the hope and promises that Jesus' return brings to each of us. Welcome to our Easter service where we rejoice in the triumphant return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we come together in worship, let us open our hearts to the joy and wonder of this sacred day. May our songs, prayers, and reflections unite us in gratitude for the ultimate sacrifice and the everlasting love that Easter represents. Now if you'll please stand for the call to worship and the choir will be singing Alive Alive.
share today or any prayer requests that they'd like to share with us today? We're glad to have our oldest daughter with us in our church this morning. Yes, sir. We're glad to have her, too. All right, on. It's nice to be back. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I feel like they won't turn you away anytime you come. We're that's glad good, you're here. Thanks for sharing that. What else? Our favorite granddaughter is 16 today. Woo-hoo! 16! You want to come up here? Real quick? Okay. <laughs> that was that was super cool, of you, because this day is about Jesus, right? So way to way to just be holy. <coughs> We're celebrating with you. That's awesome. Who else? What else? Praises, prayers. Chris family. What? Chris family. Yes, ma'am. You got it, okay? The Chris family. Who else? Bonnie Bruce. Got it. Got it, Joyce. And I'll say praise. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you, man. We, we miss you. It's good to see you. Who else? Steve Major. Steve Major. You got it. Hey now. Say it again. Hey now. Hey now. Got it. And also, I was, I was given a couple, uh, Rita Bennett, Lawrence Carter, and two unspoken prayers. We'll add those to the prayer list as well. Who else? Prayers or praises? Renee Potts. Renee Potts. Yes. You got it. <coughs> Who else? Anybody else? We had a couple having surgery this week. We need to pray for them. Yes, ma'am. Some surgeries this week. Be in prayer. Thanks for that. Who else? Eddie Spielman. Eddie Spielman. Yes, sir. You got it, Jake. Who else? The family of Ronnie Metcalf. Family of Ronnie Metcalf. And he's the captain that died at the Lexington Fire Department. Yes, sir. And there was an Amber Alert there. I, I feel like I might have heard something. Was <laughs> do we need to be in prayer for anybody? Amen. Oh man, we'll just we'll lift up whatever that need that was. And I'm not sure, but I got a phone call yesterday. Somebody else knows Kathy Brown. Bill Brown's call passed away. I just got a phone call now. Who did? I don't know. Somebody else knows Kathy Brown. Nobody else heard. Okay. I don't say who told me because I, you know, I really know the best I know. You got it. We'll figure it out. Thanks, Nancy. Who else? Anybody else? I'm good to have my son-in-law Eric here today, my daughter Samantha. Yes, it is. It's good to see those guys. Breakfast was awesome. Yes, ma'am. Shout out to the chefs. Sunrise service was awesome. Shout out to everybody who had something to do with that. Who? All the babies. All babies and children. Yes, ma'am. We like that. We like that soundtrack going on. What else? Anybody else? Jessica's 18 today. What? 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 I have two adults and I know long as possible. that's on a heart unspoken. We lay that at your feet and ask that you would meet us in this place. 
that where there needs to be healing, there would be healing. Where there needs to be uh, where there needs to be comfort and assurance, there would be comfort and assurance. Where there needs to be growth, where there needs to be a light shining in the darkness, that it would be so. Father, for friends and family that we have that just need to know you, Lord, we ask that you would use us wherever you see fit in that, and we pray, Father, for their hearts to wake up. Lord, we thank you for your presence here, and we ask that you continue to guide us. And we ask all these things in your precious name, Jesus, and all God's children said together, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship God with our tithes and our offerings. And during the offering day, you can remain seated, but we'll be singing together. Uh, words will be on the screen, and I think we're going to sing it through twice. So if it's not twice, that's what you've got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good to us. Father, we ask that you bless these gifts that we give back to you. Our first fruits, as we remember, you are the first fruits risen from the dead. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless these gifts for the service of your kingdom and the sharing of the gospel. And shine light in dark places. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood shed on the cross for our sins. Lord, you did that for us. Thank you. Father, that we would be washed clean in the blood, by the blood, through the blood, because of the blood, and rejoicing in a risen Savior. Father, that you would be here with us, that you would be more than that, that you would just own our hearts and lives at this moment, Father. We surrender to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So, Easter, man. It, this is my favorite. I, I love Easter. Uh, Christmas is awesome, and I like Christmas too, but Easter, man, I just dig Easter. And you say, well, bud, you're the preacher. you got to love Easter. I love it. I loved it when I wasn't a preacher too. I just like it, man. Easter's what it's about. But let me ask you a question. Easter, man, it's the it's the victory over sin and death. Yeah. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus rose from the grave. Uh, God accepted the payment for the sins by proving through the receipt of His risen Son that the payment was accepted. So we are set free from sin and set free from death. That matters long term, right? So if you're a follower of Jesus, death has no hold over you, right? So, so death has no hold over you. You are headed from here to heaven. Boom. What does Easter matter in the meantime? Between now and then, right? So we're, we're secure and we're safe. And man, that is the deal, right? But what does it matter today? What about all the struggles you go through today? What about the week ahead of you this week? What does that matter? What does Easter matter to you today? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about who goes before you. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And before some of you get excited or feel like you missed a lot of Sundays, we skipped a few chapters in Mark there. All right, we ended in Mark chapter 12, but it's kind of important to be in Mark 16 today. So we skipped ahead. We're going to read the end of the story, and then we'll go back and regroup on the other, okay? But who goes before you? I'm going to read to you a letter to an editor that was found in a newspaper. And uh, it's, it's one of my all-time favorites, man. It's just short. It's short. But uh, uh, this is kind of a trend now, and so a lot of people are doing it. But it was interesting to know. This happened quite a few years ago. It's just interesting to know who started it. All right? So uh, uh, I'm going to read it. As, as far as I can tell, this is the original account in the local newspaper. And for those of you of a certain age... A newspaper is a large piece of paper with print that you actually hold in your hands, right? Okay. All right, so, uh, so here's, the, here's the, the letter to the editor. I am 83 years old. I was in the McDonald's drive-thru this morning, and the young lady behind me leaned on her horn and started honking and mouthing some ugly things because I was taking too long to place my order. So, when I got to the first window, I paid for her order, along with my order. Oh. The cashier must have told her what I had done because as we moved up, she leaned out her window and waved and began mouthing. Thank you. Thank you. Probably feeling embarrassed that I had repaid her rudeness with kindness. When I got to the second window, I showed the server both receipts, and I took her food too. <laughs> <laughs> now, says the 83-year-old lady, now she has to go back to the end of the queue and start all over again. She said... Don't blow your horn at old people. We've been around a long time. <laughs> I love that. I'd like to know that lady. All right. So, uh, so sometimes in life, man, it, it matters who goes before you. Sometimes it matters who goes before you. And in Luke 16, 1 through 8, it certainly mattered who came before these guys. Now, I will, we'll unpack some of that, but let's start right here in the Scripture, okay? So Mark chapter 16 Beginning at verse 1, we're going to go 1 through 8, and we'll unpack it, and then we'll talk about it, okay? So when the Sabbath was passed, right? So Jesus had hung on the cross. Jesus had laid in the grave. It's the third day. When the Sabbath, the high holy day, had passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. 
So when the Sabbath had passed, right? So, so when the, the Sabbath, like think Saturday, had passed, three stars show in the sky. As soon as the evening comes and three stars show in the sky, the Sabbath is over, right? When we were in, we were in Israel, you know, on the Sabbath, you couldn't even push an elevator button in Jerusalem. They would just light up automatically and stop at every floor because that would be work. But as soon as three stars show in the sky, the Sabbath's over, and then it's back to work, right? So when the Sabbath had passed, Mary, Mary, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And we say it was very early in the morning. They were allowed to purchase those spices as soon as those three stars show in the sky. So they may have done it that evening. They may have purchased them early that morning. But the spices you're thinking of, like myrrh and aloe, they went and purchased these on their own account. They were pretty expensive. It wasn't for preservation. It's not Egypt. They're not the pyramid. They're not preserving the body. It was a show of respect, right? And, and also, by the way, you know the end of the story that Jesus wasn't there to anoint. And so there was an anointing of Jesus a few chapters earlier. And we'll go back through this when we get there. But it was when the lady poured perfume on Jesus' feet. That was the anointing that Jesus got. But they show up with the spices so that they might go and anoint him. Verse 2, And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, so it's bright, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? So these three women are walking in broad daylight. Where are the men, by the way? Cowering in the upper room, scared for their lives. And these three women are walking. The sun's up, so they're not hidden by night. They're walking to the tomb. And on the way to the tomb, they say, hey, there's going to be a big stone there. Who will roll away the stone? So on the way to a big problem, they're thinking about a small problem as well. You ever been there? Where you're like, man, if there's one more thing that i got to take care of. Who will roll away the stone for, the, for us from the entrance of the tomb? Verse 4. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. Would you be alarmed? <laughs> yeah. So, so they walk into the tomb. There's a young man in a white robe. This is an angel, right? And Mark mentions one angel. Some other gospels mention two angels. And a lot of people say, well, there you go. You can't trust the Bible. Can I, can I do a mathematical fact for you? If, if you have one... You could also have two. If you have two, that doesn't mean you can't have one. If you have two, one's a part of two. Right? So just like witnesses, the four Gospels are witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each tell a story. When a witness gets on the stand, you hear the, the story from one witness, but there may be additional details from another witness. Alright? So Mark's detail is, here's this story about this angel. Alright? So, looking up, they see this, uh, they see the stone roll away and entering the tomb. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, because he was very astute and a good reader of facial expressions, don't be alarmed. <laughs> you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. <coughs> he has risen. He is not here. That's just real quick about he has risen, right? The, the language that Mark's using right there, the verbiage that he's using, he has risen. That's a passive aggressive. If you went to the original translation, it's passive aggressive. And what he's saying is, God has risen in him. And that's important because of what we just mentioned earlier, right? So Jesus died for our sins to pay the debt that we owed of sin to God because we owed this debt to God. And God gives us, the world, this receipt by saying, I accept the payment, I raise my son from the dead. So God has risen him as a receipt of payment that all debt is paid, it is finished, to tell us die, all good, right? So it, he has risen, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. Verse 7, but go tell his disciples and Peter. And real quick, that's important because what's the backstory of Peter? Man, he betrayed Jesus three times. We know that, right? So at this time, Peter's in an upper room. He's scared for his life. And he's feeling guilt and shame and probably not feeling much like a disciple. And God's word to this angel to tell those three women is tell the disciples. And just in case he doubts he's not still one of the disciples, tell Peter. Specifically tell Peter. That should assure you if you've messed up in your relationship with Jesus, 
that he's not finished with you. He said, go tell the disciples and Peter, points them out specifically, that he is going before you. Jesus is going before you to Galilee. And there you'll see him just as he told you. And they went out, the women, verse 8, they went out and they fled from the tomb. <laughs> they fled from the tomb. They got out of there as quick as they could. For trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, we'll unpack that here in a minute. But, but you see what's happening here, right? Is that, is that the women were doing something risky, right? Is that, that the men were hiding, and the women were doing something risky. Now, there's a couple parts to this, right? If you go to a country today that's in the middle of war, a lot of times you see the men in hiding because people are after their lives, but the women are free to walk around because, uh, because they are seen as not as much of a threat in those other countries. And at this time, the women were not seen as much, of a as much of a threat, so they were able to go out and walk around. However, when you read in Acts, and you read that Paul was coming to, to arrest Christians, it says he arrested what? The men? the women, and the children, right? Why? Because all of them were spreading God's word. They were all part of the thing, right? So Christ kind of operates on this whole, whole nother level, right? But at this time, the women were able to do it, but it was still risky. They had invested their own money in the spices. They had invested their time. And, and can you just kind of read between the lines here? Can, can you read between the lines of these women, right? And on the way to the tomb, they're saying, man, nobody's here to help us. Does that maybe sound like, where are the stinking disciples? Nobody's here to help us. Why is nobody here to help us? See, people are people, right? Like all throughout time, people are people. When we were in Israel, uh, you know, they were speaking a different language. But uh, most, most times, but when Terry and I were waiting in line one night for, to go somewhere, that was during the time where Aaron Rodgers from the Green Bay Packers was a free agent, and he was going to sign with somebody, and nobody knew who. And we're in Israel in this other country, and these teenagers come up, and apparently the news just broke, Aaron Rodgers signed with the Jets, and these teenagers in Israel start jumping up and down, and they say, Rodgers to the Jets, Rodgers to the Jets. And we were like, man, people are the same no matter where you go. I told them I was a Bears fan, and they made fun of us because I was a Bears fan, right? But, but then people are the same no matter where you go. I'm in a grocery store, and I'm behind people that, that we speak a different language, and it's a mom and two kids, right? And mom and two kids. Now, I don't understand the language they speak because I'm not very intelligent, but they're speaking, and the two boys are probably like five and eight. And all of a sudden, the eight-year-old, the older kid, just unloads, bam, on the five-year-old, just smacks him in the back of the head. And the five-year-old starts yelling and fussing, and the eight-year-old starts yelling, and it's a different language, and I can't understand it. <coughs> but I knew what they were saying. <laughs> right. That five-year-old said, you better not hit me again, I'm going to tell mom. And that eight-year-old said, you shut your mouth, or there'll be worse than that smack on the head. I know that. <laughs> and then that mom heard him fussing, and she turned around, and she said some stuff in a language I couldn't understand because I'm not very intelligent. And I didn't know what she said, but I knew what she said. You know what I mean? Because people are the same. Because people are the same. And so, so a lot of times you look at like plaster statues and stone statues of the saints and you say they live different. These women were the same as us. And so on the way to the tomb, they say, man, there, there had to be somebody to help us. But nobody's here to help us. And, and then they get to the tomb and man, there's, Jesus isn't even there. And if you, read, if you read another account, Mary says, where have you taken him? They don't even know. Right? And so they've, they've invested their time, they've invested their money, they've invested their energy, they've invested their resources, and they show up, and Jesus isn't even there to anoint. They showed up to pay respect to Jesus, and he isn't even there to anoint. Yet, you ever been in a situation where you were already upset about something? Some major man, you were already just right on the edge. And then something else happens, and it's like, that's it. I'm done. No more. I can't handle one more thing about this. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your, your family. Maybe it's your kids. Kids, maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's your church. Maybe it's God. And you're like, God, man, 
You send one more thing my way. I'm done. I'm done. So he's like, didn't understand just yet what was happening. They didn't know exactly. They just knew they showed up to anoint a body. And that body was gone. It was somebody they loved. And it was gone. You got, you got a few choices in a situation where you're feeling frustrated. Right? Everybody familiar with Ted Turner? Remember Ted Turner? Uh, Roman Braves at one point, and uh, TBS, and TNT, and all that. Back when people watched TV, but they didn't stream stuff, right? And, and back when you'd have to go to the beach to get cable TV, right? Ted Turner, like billionaire, right? So, so there was a time in Ted Turner's life where Ted Turner was crazy about Jesus Christ. Right? Not so much later on, but... It was a time when Ted Turner was 15 years old. He was actually going to be a missionary. And he was the guy at the high school who would tell everybody about Jesus. And he, he tells his story. He says, I had a little sister. She was 12 years old. She had a disease. And I would watch her suffer with that disease. And I would watch her cry out in pain. And I just said, God, this isn't fair. It's not right. And his faith began to weaken. And then she passed away. And he watched his father, who had been a believer one time, give up and really give up, commit suicide. And Ted Turner said, man, if that's, if that's what God has, I'm done. I'm done. Maybe, maybe you face a situation in your life and you said, you say, God, I can't handle one more thing. I can't handle one more. And this thing that you just did is just not fair. And you got some choices. You can, you can give up, like Ted Turner. You can say, forget it. I'm done. You can isolate yourself, and you can pretend it didn't really happen. I can just tell myself, it's going to be okay, even though I don't believe it's going to be okay. That creates false faith. No. Or you can lean in. You can lean into God in a situation like that. The only way you're going to lean into God in a situation like that is if you have a love for Jesus Christ. Imagine the temptation of these women to just go back home. Imagine the temptation of these women who showed up and they're already a little worried about the stone and then they get in and Jesus isn't even there. And like I said, at that moment, they didn't really understand what was happening. They just knew he wasn't there. Mary says in another gospel, where have you laid him? I, I don't know where you put him. Just show me where you put him. They think he's gone. There's a temptation to go back home. But they didn't. They went in, they heard from the angel, and they did something. Why would they do that? Why, here's what, all right, do me in right here. Why would they do that? Why would they carry on in the middle of this point? It's because they loved Jesus. They loved Jesus. They had walked around with Jesus, and they listened to Jesus, and they sat at his feet, and they <coughs> loved him. They spent some time with him, and there was a relationship there with Jesus Christ. And because there was a relationship, can I ask you something? Do you remember when you loved Jesus? Do you remember when your heart was just so on fire for Jesus that it was like somebody, I dare somebody to ask me about Jesus because I'm about to tell them. And then you go through a rough patch and you're like, man, I hope somebody asked me a question about Jesus. These ladies were so in love with Jesus that they said, they said, we don't, we don't know what's happening, but we're going to go on. There, there needed to be a relationship with Jesus there. Right? There needed, to be, there needed to be a relationship. Because, see, Jesus had got them into this. Other people were home asleep. Jesus had got them into this. But there needed to be a relationship with Jesus. Right? Check this out. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 2. Right? Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, it talks about that stone. Right? So they're on the way somewhere. Remember these ladies? They're on their way to deal with a large problem. And then they encountered a smaller problem. It's like, man, one more thing. What's going to happen with the stone? 28, 2. Matthew 28, verse 2. Listen up. This is Matthew's further details about how that stone got rolled back. Verse 1, same thing. These ladies are headed to the tomb. Verse 2. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I like that. And sat on it. Just kicking his feet back against the stone. Just sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. But the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. 
And now you see Jesus. The stone wasn't rolled away because Jesus needed a doorway out. The stone was rolled away because the women needed a doorway in. And you understand that these women who were just taking a walk because they loved Jesus Christ so much they had to be with Him, that God went ahead of them and rolled the stone away. And here's the first thing I want you to remember today. There's only two of these things, so I'll get you out of here, okay? But the first thing I want you to remember today is that if you're going to encounter tough things in life, and you are, you have, you will, you are, there needs to be a relationship with Jesus where you would say, I'm going to hold on tight to Him, and even if I don't understand it, He's going to pull me through, and He's going to roll a stone away when I need a stone rolled away. Because the women would have never seen the empty tomb if God wasn't able to move the stone away. But they needed a relationship with Jesus first for that to happen. They were on their way to deal with a large problem. They encountered a small problem. But if they didn't show up at all, they would have missed the whole thing. Do you remember when you loved Jesus Christ? Would it make you walk into an uncomfortable situation? Here's the deal. Here, when you go on, here's where, here's where it kicks in, right? Okay, Jesus, we're in the tomb, right? So, so you roll the stone away, Mark 16. Who rolled away the stone? The stones rolled away. And, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. All right, Jesus, we, we're here. We came to do what you told us to do. We came to show you respect. And now we feel like we're in the wrong place. You're not even here. Jesus, I love you. And I came looking for you. But you're not even here. Have you been there on your walk with Jesus where you said, Jesus, I'm trying to follow where you say follow. And I'm trying to do what you say do. And, and I'm really trying hard here. And I'm, I'm where I think I'm supposed to be. But you're not here anymore. <clears throat> but I don't even know what to do now that you're not here. Now, here's the thing. The women were looking for a dead body. Weren't they? The angel in the gospel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? The women came looking for a dead body. They thought they were doing right because they loved Jesus with all their heart. Right? And so you should love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But when you get there, you need a little help. When you start walking with Jesus, you need a little help. And here's what happens, right? So they show up, and they begin to say, we're in the wrong place. What did you do with the body? Okay, I love Jesus, but it feels like I took a wrong turn somewhere. God, I'm trying here, but you seem out of reach. God, I'm already having a tough time, but you, see out, you seem out of reach. There was an old story about a fellow who, uh, who was driving through the countryside. And he was driving through the countryside, and he looks over in a field, and there's chickens with three legs. Not just one chicken, but multiple. A whole field full of... It's not a true story, I don't think. There's a whole field full of chickens with three legs. Right? And he looks, and he just sees field after field, and just chickens with three legs. And he finds the farmer there in the field and he rolls down his window and he hollers at the farmer and he says, hey, can I ask you a question? The farmer says, sure. And he says, man, do those chickens have three legs? And the farmer said, well, yeah. And the guy said, well, why in the world do those chickens have three legs? And the farmer said, well, do you like drumsticks? And he said, yeah. And he said, do you, does your wife like drumsticks? And he said, yeah. He said, do you ever say have a friend over who also likes drumsticks? And the guy said, yeah. And he said, well, wouldn't you need three drumsticks? And the guy said, yeah. And the guy said, well, tell me this. How did it taste? And about that time, one of those three-legged chickens just, you know, zooms by. And the farmer says, we don't know. We can't catch them. We... <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably not a true story. Right? But, but here's the thing, is sometimes you walk with God and you're like, God, your desire, man, I, I know your desire for God. I, I want to spend time with you because I know it's, it's right to spend time with you and it fills me up. But, but God, can I just be honest right now? I feel like I can't catch you right now. I, I feel like I showed up to the wrong place. And my heart's sort of empty here. Jesus, I love you. You know, we talked about that. The women love Jesus.
Jesus, but they were in this moment where they didn't know what to do next in their relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've said, Jesus, I give my heart to you, but I ain't really sure what to do next. Okay, check this out. I said, he's not here. And the angel said, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee, and there you'll see him just as he told you. And they went out, and they went out, and they went out, and they did what he said. They went out, and they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment and seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, but they were afraid. Sometimes when you're in a spot and you don't really understand why you're there and you think you may be in the wrong spot, do you know what you should do? You should do what God tells you to do. Now hold on. Don't roll your eyes yet. That, that angel told the women what to do. Now where did the angel, where do angels get their instruction from? Well, they get their instruction from God. So God gave the angels who were messengers words for the women who were feeling a little lost. And don't roll your eyes just yet. Again, please. Well, if only there was a source of information where God told me and instructed me on what to do. If only there was somewhere I could look for God's guidance. If only there was like a God book He would give me. If only there were like words on a page where God would instruct me and I could read them and it would be like, oh, that's what I should do. Look, if, if, if you love Jesus with your whole heart, if you, if you love when you're and you man, Jesus, I love you, but I'm not sure what to do, you should spend some time in His Word. Because He has given us His Word to us. But if you've been living your life as a Christian and not spending any time listening to His Word or reading His Word, it's no wonder you're lost. It's, it's no wonder you feel like you don't know where you are. <clears throat> and look, I mean that for a lifetime as a Christian. I mean that for a week as a Christian. If you're, if you're a believer and you're like, man, I, I read my Bible right on a regular basis, and then you go about a week, and you know that happens, right? I know that happens. Okay, that happens to you preachers sometimes too. Right? Where you're like, man, I missed a day. Well, I'll get it tomorrow. Well, I'll miss two days. Well, I'll get it the next day. Well, I'll miss three days. Well, then a week happens, and you're like, man, you know what? I feel worn out and lost. Wonder why? Wonder why? It's the most critical thing to do. Prayer and read your Bible. It's not rocket science, right? Just pick a book, open it up, and start reading it, and call me if you need some help. <coughs> and I'll call mine. <laughs> so, so listen, here's the deal. I mean, he's given us his word. So sometimes, man, we love him with our whole heart, and, and we show up and we do what he says. We just need guidance. We need his word. Right? And here's, here's the comfort. You know Psalm 139? You know it says there's no place I can flee from his presence. If I, if I go to the depths of hell there, you're here with me. There you are with me. If I go wherever, you're with me. You you hem me in. You are behind me and in front of me. Psalm 139, 5. You're behind me and in front of me. You go with me. Wherever I go, even if I'm scared like these women, we'll, we'll wrap that up in a second, but even if I'm scared like these women, you go behind me and in front of me. Psalm 139, 5 says that. Wherever I go, you're before me and behind me. You ever taught a kid or a grandkid or a little kid how to swim in a swimming pool? Right? We've taught a couple kids how to swim in a swimming pool. And, and I'll get on one side, and, and, and Tara will get on the other side, and we'll, we'll set that kid loose for a few steps, and I'll be behind, and she'll be in front, and if they start failing at any moment, we'll scoop them up, try again. What we won't do is say, <laughs> look at that kid who can't swim. Right? What we won't do is just set it up and then go over to the side and, and sip a Coca Cola. Well, one of us will be in front of them and one will be behind because they can't swim yet. So we'll teach them how to swim. But we won't leave their side. We'll be in front of them or behind them. And the Bible says God's like that. When He sets you on your way, you have this love in your heart for Him. And when you're studying His Word and you're trying to figure out what to do and how to live and where to go, that He'll be behind you and He'll be in front of you. And He'll hem you in and He'll take care of you when you start to sing. Because sometimes you'll feel like you'll start to sing. So listen, here, here's how this story kind of, kind of wraps up, right? So these women left, and you're like, man, that's, that's cool, Wes, that's a great story. The, the women did what the angel said, 
but buddy, if, if you got your Bible open, you can say, but buddy, it doesn't look like it's that comfortable for the women, right? And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone. But we're afraid, and you're like, what kind of witness is that? They said nothing to anyone? So, so your instructors go out and say nothing to anyone? Well, what I say? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You read them in totality. You read them as a whole, right? So yes, they were scared to death. Yes, they were scared to say anything, because that's what it says right there. But Matthew chapter 28, verses 8 through 10, kind of gives you some more details of what happened next. Matthew 28, 8, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples, even though they were frightened and scared, they didn't really want to say, the angel said do it, so they went. And behold, Jesus met them on the way. What? They left, they did what the angel said, and Jesus met them on the way. And he said, greetings. <laughs> How about that? Greetings. <clears throat> I just defeated sin and death. Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go tell everybody. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. You know what God just did? He said, he said all right, the angel, tell them to go. I'm behind them. I'm pushing them out. You know what he did? Jesus in front of them. Come on. I'm going to meet you along the way. And you know, that's what he does. You know, you have this love for Jesus in your heart. And you say, Jesus, I'm not even sure what to do next. But I'm going to spend some time praying. I'm going to spend some time in your word. And so you start walking. And God says, I'll push you out. I'll push you out. And I'll catch you when you need to catch you. But look, you won't know that if you're not walking forward. You'll miss it. If the women had given up and went home, they'd have missed the whole thing. If the women had given up and went home, everybody might have missed the whole thing. Because God had chosen to share everything through those women. Man, when you, when you listen to the Word and you take it seriously, and you have this heart and this love for Jesus, let me ask you a question. What would change in your heart? What would change in your life if you believed that Jesus would catch you What would change in your daily actions if you believed that Jesus would meet you along the way? If you were spending time in prayer, and you were spending time in His Word, and you were spending time in that relationship, and you had a love for Jesus Christ, and you found yourself in an uncomfortable situation, you weren't sure which way to go, and you prayed about it, and you felt sure on your heart, there was a peace on your heart, well, I need to go this direction. What would happen if you truly believed He would meet you there and catch you? Wouldn't you go? But see, you, you won't go unless you believe he'll meet you on the way. Let me, let me tell you about the kind of God you got. Let me tell you about the, the kind of Savior you serve. Right? We'll, we'll just start wrapping up with this. But let me tell you about the kind of Savior you serve. When I was, when I was a little kid, uh, we used to go to, to Myrtle Beach. That was our big vacation every year, man. Myrtle Beach. By God's Myrtle Beach. Right? And we go to Myrtle Beach and we stay in the Sea Villa 3. And it had an air-conditioned window unit. And it had 42 channels, which was... 40 more than we had at home, man, on cable TV, right? And we would go out to the beach every morning, and, and man, my mom was a beachaholic, and so she would literally, as the sun would, would rise, she was like to the beach, as these women were to the tomb, like early in the morning. As the sun would rise, we would head out to the beach, and she'd take a chair, and it was those trifold chairs, remember <laughs> right? Where, that way and that way. And then if you didn't get it right, you had to go back all the way in and come back right. And she'd take that trombone chair and she'd take it to the beach and we'd take a bag with the bucket. That was my bag to carry because it's my stuff. So G.I. Joe men, and it had to be G.I. Joe men, and I was comfortable with losing, not the ones I was uncomfortable with losing. And we'd go out to the beach, right? And we'd spend all day at the beach. Sun, sunrise, you're on the beach. She packed sandwiches and crackers, you're on the beach. And you had one. Ocean toy, the, the rafts, you know, like you saw in Jaws, when Jaws ate that kid with the kicking his legs in the water, and you got one raft, right? And you go out to the beach and you spend all day out there on the water, out, all day out there on the sand. You eat lunch, and the sandwich would have sand in it. And all week that week, all week, I was, I was seven or eight years old, about seven or eight years old, I had gotten in my head that I wanted to find a sand dock, more than a sand dock, more than anything else, right? And, uh, and all week, man, I scoured the beach for sand dollars. Scoured the beach for sand dollars. All week long, looked and looked and dug like it was treasure in the sand and just, man, all week. 
which was great for my mom because it kept me busy all day long, right? But all weekend, by the end of the week, I was getting frustrated and I was getting depressed. It began to sink in that I'm not going to get a sand dollar. And every day I looked, and every day I searched, you know, top of the beach, bottom of the beach, in the surf, nothing. Found a little bit of pieces, but I wanted a whole sand dollar. And the last day on the beach, last day on the beach, day's over, it's time to pack up, time to go in for supper. I go up, and there, under the trifold chair, is <laughs> my sand bucket. And it's upside down, so kind of the, the top, right? It's on top. And, and uh, about to leave, and my mom casually says, don't forget your bucket. And so I picked up that sand dollar, and there, underneath that bucket, is a whole pristine, bright, white, clean sand dollar. And that's great, but I mean, Bright white, you know what I mean? Right, like poor off white sand dollar, and it is it is spotless and clean and pure, and well, not probably not pure from Myrtle Beach, but it was it was perfect. Right? It was a perfect sand dollar, and I knew immediately that that was not a natural sand dollar, even at seven or eight years old. But I was like, and I was kind of like, hey. Mom, found a sand dollar. And she said, oh, oh, really? That's, that's fantastic. I can't believe you worked so hard. Way to go. And, uh, and I picked it up and, and kind of took it home and uh, just put it up and just kind of kind of be around there for a little while. And, and over the years, man, I just kind of, for the heck of it, I don't know, I just kind of kept up with it. Went away to college and, and had, I'm a, I'm a put stuff in a little box kind of guy. I'm that guy. Like I, there's a few items in life, like seven or eight items in life that I have in a little box that are just special to me. And I'm, I'm that guy. And, and I took that little box to college and, and I opened it one day and there was that sand dollar in there. And I was like, man, I don't even know how that made the cut for the box. But it's in the box and I got to thinking about it, right? And it, it just, you know, it, it just hit me at that age, about 20 years old, and it, it just hit me at that age. I was like, you know, I was a little kid searching for something that I could not find. I had no hope of finding that thing. I was inadequate. I didn't really have the, the ability to do it. And I certainly couldn't find one whole and perfect like that. And I certainly didn't have the money to go purchase my own. But at some point during that week, my mom, who literally won't come off the beach all week long, Right, decided to sacrifice some of her time, went to a store, purchased it with her money, brought it back for her kid, stuck it there because he couldn't do it himself. Right, and, that, and I was lucky enough to grow up like that, where I never doubted that I was loved for one moment. Right, never doubted that. And she took something I couldn't do and gave me something whole, put it together, and washed clean. And you know, if, if you believed that you served a God who when He saw you struggle, when He saw you hurt, when He saw you lost and wondering, if you believed you served a God who cared about that, who would, who would come to you alongside you and say, you couldn't do this, but I can. And He would gift to you what you could not afford by yourself. If you believe that you served a God like that, and you do serve a God like that, it would give you the confidence to say, He goes before me. And where He says go, I'll go. And what He says do, I'll do. And He'll catch me along the way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for going before us. Father, we thank You for giving us things that we don't always understand and giving us jobs that sometimes we feel inadequate to do because that causes us to lean in to You. And Father, we may have missed it otherwise. And so Lord, as we serve You and as we dig into Your Word and as we spend time praying and Father, as we just spend time getting to know You, we would ask that you would meet us where we are. 
Fill us up in ways we could never do without you. Redeem us and wash us clean and make us whole. And Father, we ask these things in the name of a risen Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all God's children said together, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together, Oh, how he loves you and me. It's on the screen or in your black book.